let us turn to consider the Word of God. And particularly, may I direct your attention to the words of Paul in Colossians chapter 2. Let us read there again verses 11 and 12. In whom, in Christ, also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who have raised him from the dead. And my theme this evening especially centers around the words there at the end of verse 11, the circumcision of Christ. What was it that happened when Jesus came? How are we to understand our Lord's coming in relation to the outworking of God's salvation? Was it the case that when Jesus came, God was saying no to all that had gone before. Are we to think of the, the New Covenant and the New Testament as inevitably involving God drawing a line through the Old Testament and saying, I must start all over again? Not at all. Oh, there had been a time. There had been a time when God did start all over again. But that was not when Jesus was born at Bethlehem. It was right back in Eden when man disobeyed that God started all over again. God had said, you shall surely die. And he could have put that into effect immediately. He could have wiped out our first parents. He could have obliterated this universe and started all over again from scratch. But he displayed grace. He showed that he had decided to do something much more difficult. He started all over again, but not from scratch, but rather by way of recovering that which was lost. He started again to restore what had been polluted by sin to reclaim those who were in rebellion against him. Salvation from God starts right back in Genesis 3 with the promise of what would happen through the seed of the woman. And it is the same salvation that has been at work ever since. Now that's not to say that the coming of Jesus didn't change anything at all. Of course it did. But the change was not that of stopping up one way and starting all over again on a radically different recovery program. It was rather the change between something promised and something realized. Think of the situation where perhaps parents are going to give a present to a child. And the present just too big to be hidden round the house somewhere. So instead it's, it's wrapped up in wrapping paper and placed in a room. You can see the child looking at what's there and the shape of the wrapping paper tells it something. And perhaps the child gets a hint now and again about what might be underneath the wrapping paper. And then again, there's that little bit of wrapping paper that's torn. No one quite knows how. You can peek in and see a little bit of what's behind it. All the hints, all the guesses, are nothing at all like seeing the gift unwrapped. And it's something the same way that God dealt with his people. The way the promise came was first of all shrouded in mystery, wrapped up, as it were. And as time went on, God revealed a bit more. 
But still, until the coming of Christ, the wrapping paper was on the gift. But now we live in the age when we see Jesus. We now live in the age where things are clearly set before us. In Galatians 3, we're told that the gospel was announced in advance to Abraham. His salvation had the same origin as ours. It was the same gospel in essence, based on what God's grace would do. It was the same gospel that had the foundation of the finished work that Christ would perform. Abraham's salvation came the same way, by faith. But oh, now we're seeing Jesus and salvation has the wrapping paper off. We're no longer living in the age of shadows, the age of anticipation. We're in the age of light, in the age of realization. But the reality in Christ Jesus, the gift from God, is the same throughout. Now here in Colossians, in this striking phrase, the circumcision of Christ, Paul is bringing together something of what went before with something from what came after. He's bringing together something from the Old Testament with Christ who is clearly revealed in the New Testament. And the way Paul joins these two together and makes this connection is very important for our understanding of Scripture. And there are three aspects of the situation uh, that I want to lay before you this evening. And the first of them is this. Not only is the way of salvation the same before and after Christ, not only is it the case that it is only by faith that we are saved, that not, and the, the salvation is not of ourselves, but of God's providing. It's also the case that there is a continuity between what God has appointed to accompany that salvation. It is not just the case that the basic salvation by grace, faith, remains constant. Things that accompany salvation are brought into connection also. Paul here links decisively circumcision and baptism. He says here to the church in Colossae, which was troubled by uh, false teachers, there was controversy over circumcision. He says to them, to understand circumcision, you have to understand baptism. And to understand baptism, you have to understand circumcision, because in principle they're the same. Bring these things together. Oh, there are changes. You couldn't possibly say they were identical, but at root, they are the same. Can I put it another way? We can see the same thing happening elsewhere in Scripture. And especially is it clear when we go into the upper room on the night when our Lord was betrayed. And there, there had been a Passover meal, Passover from the Old Testament. But Jesus said, in instituting the Lord's Supper, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Jesus deliberately instituted the Lord's Supper after, or in the course of, rather, a Passover meal. And he was, by, by that deliberate act, he was saying something to his disciples. He was saying, this has come in the place of that. What I am giving you now is not something radical in you. It is not something that comes out of the blue. It is something, rather, that is in the age of light, corresponding to what had already been in the age of shadows. When Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, it was as the New Testament replacement for the Old Testament Passover. It is the same, yet it's different. It's different, yet it's the same. And when we think about the Lord's Supper or about baptism, 
But we have to hold both the sameness and the difference between the Old and New Testament realities in our minds. Because the gift of salvation, having been unwrapped with the coming of Christ, means that the revelation of God's salvation has, has moved on into the age of realization. It's no longer the age of promise it's the age now of reality arrived. We've left the age of blood sacrifices, foreshadowing the one final sacrifice. And we've entered the age of the final sacrifice that has been definitively offered. And so what is now found, what are now found as the sacraments of the New Testament church, inevitably are different. Because they are reflecting the fact that we are in the age when there is now no more offering for sin. It has been once for all accomplished. And yet, they are essentially the same. Because the change that came with the coming of Christ wasn't an unplanned change. It wasn't some makeshift expedient that God devised. Oh, when baptism was inaugurated and the Lord's Supper also. They were divinely shaped to point to the one reality of salvation through the shed blood. They were appointed by God to bring the same message to the church in the New Testament age as it had been to the church in the Old Testament age. They're the same and yet they're different. And that's true both as regards Passover and Lord's Supper and as regards circumcision and baptism. On the one side, the sacraments with blood from before Christ's sacrifice and on the other, the bloodless sacraments after our Lord's arrival. And yet both point to the same reality. And in the case of circumcision and baptism, they point to to the reality of entry into the kingdom of God. They are both ceremonies indicating the fact that purity, purification is needed to be found as a subject of the heavenly king. And it is as we trace out the way in which God's purposes flow on from age to age that we are taken up with holy wonder at the fullness and perfection of what God has done. So we have firstly here the fact that God's purposes move on. The reality of his salvation based on grace and appropriated by faith is the same throughout. The sacraments have an essential continuity but there is inevitable change because of the tremendous impact of the coming of Christ who has made the final sacrifice. But considering here this circumcision of Christ, the second thing that we've got to do is to ask, well, what all did circumcision involve in Old Testament days? Because as we find out what circumcision involved in Old Testament days, so we can begin to work out what may be expected of circumcision of the circumcision of Christ in New Testament days. And the Old Testament tells us very clearly that circumcision, first of all and primarily, was what God had appointed to mark the entry of an individual who believed into his covenant. And that is presented very clearly with Abraham. Abraham, in Old and New Testament alike, the man of faith, the friend of God, the one who is the father of all who believe and set before us as the pattern and the example and the stimulus for our faith. He is the one who believes. And after he had believed, Perhaps 25 years after he had first come to know the Lord in a real way, when the Lord came to him in order of the Chaldees and commanded him, Abraham, go, I want you somewhere else. And Abraham obeyed. 
perhaps after 25 years of living before the Lord in faith, God ordered circumcision for Abraham as the mark of his covenant bond, the bond that God had sovereignly created when he chose Abraham and said, you are mine. It came, the sign of circumcision came to Abraham as a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had yet being uncircumcised. And we see the same in the circumcision of Christ that the New Testament the believer has. Baptism comes as God's required outward mark upon those who are Christ's, upon those who are believing in him, upon those who are enrolled as citizens among the willing people in the day of God's power, the day of power of Christ Jesus, the priest who is also king. There is the inner believing of the individual. And there is God's command that those who believe should be baptized, showing and receiving the mark that shows that they are his. So there is a very clear parallel between circumcision as that right that God ordained for in, for those who had entered into covenant relationship with him, those who were within the sphere of his saving mercy, and baptism as it now comes in the New Testament church. But God commanded Abraham to do more. God, who had provided for Adam in his loneliness a wife, a family, honors and uses that which he's ordained. And though the salvation of God comes to us as individuals, the reality of God's salvation, the reality of God taking a life and claiming it as his own, cannot be contained within that individual. The blessing that comes from God to that individual affects those who are his or those who are hers as well. We're dealing with the same God. The God who said to Noah, go into the ark, you and your whole family, because I found you, Noah, righteous in this generation. And so the righteous Noah, by his faith, was able to provide blessing, be the channel through which God provided blessing for Noah's family also. He's the same God who comes to Abraham and says to Abraham, I'm going to establish my covenant. I'm going to establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants, your seed after you for generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. This is my covenant which you will keep between me and you and your seed after you. Every man child among you shall be circumcised. That circumcision that Abraham had at God's command as the seal of the righteousness of his faith was a circumcision that by God's command had to be found also in every male child in his family, in his household. And this is not something that is to be left off in the Old Testament. The promise and this aspect of it still remains. Paul is at pains time and again to remind the Christian church that those who believe in Christ are Abram's seed. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abram's seed and heirs according to the promise, the promise that was delivered in covenant to Abraham when the gospel was preached to him long before him. In Christ, belonging to him, acknowledging him as our covenant king, we have the status of one who is an heir. And all the covenant promises are ours. They are ours because they are Christ's. He is the king, and those who are his people are those who share in the bounty that is the king's. 
We cannot have it apart from him. But in him are we of all things. And that promise is the same. As Peter made clear at Pentecost. The promise is to you and to your children. And to all who are afar off as many as the Lord our God should call. God has not abrogated his covenant. I'll keep my covenant forever. It is an everlasting, a perpetual covenant. He hasn't changed the promise. And just as the same sign of covenant blessing, the blessing that he was their God, was placed on Ishmael and later also on Isaac also. The same one as on Abraham. So too baptism is by good and necessary inference from Scripture to be extended to the infant children of believers. What's good and necessary inference and where did it come from? Good and necessary inference is just the theologian's way of saying by a valid argument from God's word. Or when the king commands, when God gives us his word, we are expected to respond intelligently to it and to apply it in various circumstances. There are those who say there's no command, there's no New Testament example for a child to be baptized. But you see, there are many things that are done in the Christian church and done properly that are not done on the basis of an explicit New Testament command, nor even by way of an historical example from the New Testament scriptures. You cannot find anywhere in the New Testament where it absolutely and clearly says, a woman may come to the Lord's table. You cannot find an historical example which conclusively proves a woman was ever at the Lord's table. But everyone's agreed that women ought to be there. It is a good and necessary inference. It's a right and valid argument from what Scripture clearly says. And none have ever doubted that they should be there. When the king's command has been given, it's to be followed through in all its implications. And in the same way, uh, the king who commanded uh, that Abraham's children be circumcised has not revoked that command, has not gone back on that aspect of his covenant promise. Indeed, it is there reinforced in the New Testament. Reinforced, I grant, indirectly, but reinforced in the terrific example of our Lord's own compassion uh, towards young children. Reinforced in the word that Peter clearly says to Jew, as a Jew to Jews, they would not misunderstand it. The promise is to you and to your children. What was he saying? He was saying the blessing of Abraham carries on still. And it's now extended to all afar off as many as the Lord our God will call. The validity of infant baptism is a validity that is scripturally grounded. That is warranted by the reality of God's salvation in his word. Now Paul is not here actually explicitly talking about infant baptism. But what he has done is to erect the apostolic bridge between circumcision and baptism. And because Paul has given us that essential link in the chain, we can follow the route that he's marked out and rely on the oneness and the security of God's covenant promises and principles over the age, and may validly conclude for what can be done in the New Testament church, because it has never been revoked. The king's law stands. But there's a third matter I'd urge in your attention, and that is the twofold nature of circumcision and baptism. Paul brings that out very clearly here. And it's only as we understand this that we'll be able to shape up to the many practical questions and problems that arise regarding circumcision and baptism. I've shown, I've indicated already 
that there is one truth, that circumcision is from the Old Testament and it corresponds to baptism in the New Testament. But there is more. In Old Testament times, there was an outer sacrament, a rite of circumcision in the flesh. But that outer sacrament required also an inner reality, a spiritual reality. It wasn't just circumcision in the flesh, wasn't just pointing forward to baptism in the New Testament. It was also pointing inward to the need for something greater within. And that's what Paul describes here as circumcision made without hands. Can I digress just for a moment? At this point, and in many passages in the New Testament uh, relating to baptism, uh, the, the NIV translators tend to reveal their baptistic presuppositions. You know the NIV is translated on the basis of the translator coming to the original, saying, what does it mean? And then saying, how can I best express that in modern English? But sometimes when we try to work out what a passage means, uh, we bring, unfortunately, with us our own presuppositions. And most of the NIV translators uh, were Baptistic. And this has meant that in many passages, particularly in the book of Acts, but also to a certain extent here, uh, the passage doesn't come across quite as I think it ought to. Here, the NIV translation is far too neat for Paul's Greek. The NIV is not with a circumcision done by the hands of men, but with a circumcision done by Christ. For a translation that likes very much to miss out conjunctions, connecting words, uh, the NIV translators have here put in a connecting word and it's the wrong one. And that's the word, but. They've invented a contrast that Paul didn't make. It's very clear in the authorized version. He says, not, he says, with a circumcision not done by hands, that is, by the circumcision of Christ. He's not making a contrast. He's saying these things are the same. He's making it clearer that the circumcision not done by hands is the circumcision of Christ. It's as if he'd added an IE at the end of the sentence, that is, by the circumcision of Christ. Not made with hands is an oblique Jewish way of saying divinely done, spiritually done. The emphasis is not so much on the fact that it's not done by man. It is very much more on the fact that it is done by someone other than man. And it is here spelled out as the circumcision of Christ. In other words, there is an inner reality of heart that is required. Paul spells out this more clearly in Romans 2 at the end. He says a man isn't a Jew if he's only one outwardly, not a circumcision merely outward and physical, and I'm quoting the NIV just to show I have no prejudice against it. A man is not a Jew who is only one outwardly, not a circumcision merely outward and physical. No. A man is a Jew if he is one inwardly. And circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the spirit, not by the written code. All saying of the Old Testament time. It wasn't the external right that guaranteed his spiritual status. It was circumcision of heart that could only be done by God's Spirit. You can read the same verses and update them. Man isn't a Christian if he's only one outwardly. Nor is baptism merely outward and physical. Oh no. A man is a Christian if he's one inwardly. And baptism is baptism of the heart by the Spirit, not by a written code. The parallel follows through. And that was always the case. In Old Testament times, it was abundantly clear. If you look through many of the references to uncircumcised and to circumcision in the Old Testament, you'll see that very often the focus is on the spiritual reality that should accompany the physical right. And especially in that verse in Deuteronomy 30 that we read, verse 6, the Lord your God will circumcise your heart. 
and the hearts of your descendants, so that you may love him with all your heart and with all your soul and live. There was the outer right, but the outer fleshly right in Old Testament times was teaching the Old Testament church. You need heart circumcision. You need to go on and use the benefits that are yours to find that circumcision that is in, that inner purification that comes from God alone so that you may love him and live. The outward sign was pointing to a divinely given inner reality. And in Old Testament times, sometimes the outward sign was before the inner reality and sometimes it was the other way around, according to God's appointment. Abraham had the inner reality long before he had the outward sign. Isaac, the child of promise, had the outward sign long before he had the inner reality. But all by God's appointment. And it is the same still. There is the inner reality of buried with him in baptism. Many misinterpret this text by supposing Paul's talking about the outer water rite of baptism. But he is not. There are many who use this text and the similar one in Romans to suggest that baptism has to be by immersion under the water burial and back up again. There are many problems with that, not least of which is that Jesus was not buried by being put under anything but being put sideways into a rocky ledge in a tomb. The motion is wrong. Another major problem with it is, why the water? The water is not a natural symbol for earth or for ground, but it does speak very eloquently of the Holy Spirit. To understand what Paul's saying, you have to realize that in the New Testament also, there is an outer right, which is its place of water baptism. And there is the inner reality of baptism of the Spirit. Right from the start, John the Baptist made that clear. He said, I baptize you with water. I can give you the outer right. But there's one coming who baptize you with the Holy Spirit. What you need is more than my outward right. It points the way, it symbolizes, it says, look, you need the baptism with the Holy Spirit and with fire that only the coming one can provide. Baptism by the Holy Spirit doesn't refer to some second stage uh, experience of the Christian. It is another way of looking at the inner change that comes when Christ the covenant king sends his Holy Spirit into a heart to cleanse and purify, regenerate and make new that heart and claim that life as his own. It is not the Holy Spirit who baptizes. It is Jesus, the covenant king. And he comes as the one who has died and says, I have died for that one. I claim him. I claim her as my own. I send the Holy Spirit who comes in the water of regeneration, the inner reality. And who cleanses that heart so that there can be faith. That there can be a love. That there can be a life that shall never end. In emphasizing the need for the inner change. We do not disparage. We dare not disparage Christ's appointed outward sight. We need that inner change. And if that inner change is ours, then we should, if we have not been baptized before, conform to the requirement of the Lord who has saved us. But just as in Old Testament times, the children of Abraham could claim, they could claim circumcision for their children. So to those who are children of Abraham by faith in Christ in New Testament time, 
may by due scriptural analogy claim baptism for their infant children because they too are heirs of the same covenant and the same promise. It doesn't mean the children are automatically saved. For each generation a new personal involvement in the promise and in the spiritual reality suspended on faith and obedience. We were singing that very clearly in Psalm 89. But the reality is there. And for each believing parent, there is the responsibility of being like Abraham. And God tells us very clearly in Genesis 18 what that means. It's not just that Abraham had faith and therefore he could be circumcised. It is also the case that God bears this testimony of Abraham. I know him. I have sovereignly chosen him so that he will command his children and his household after him and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment so that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath promised him. Privilege always entails responsibility. Paul brings that out. He said in Romans 2, there is circumcision. What really matters is inner circumcision. And then he says, well, what advantage then is the Jew? What profit is there in circumcision? The outward action. And he says, much every way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. What if some of them didn't believe after being circumcised? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? For once, well, not just for once, but the NIV there catches it very nicely because it brings out a contrast that says there in the Greek words. Will their lack of faith nullify God's faithfulness? Oh, not at all. You can apply the same to baptism. Well, what advantage has the child baptized in infancy? What profit is there in that? Much every way, chiefly because they have committed unto them the oracles, the word of God. There is the requirement, God's covenant requirement, that comes to each and every one who is at the sign of the covenant put on him or her in the young days, saying there is a privilege. And the privilege is one that should, in terms of the vows taken by the parent, have been reinforced by the privilege of hearing and knowing God's word and being brought up, pointed to the way of salvation. And that very privilege intensifies the requirement upon us to respond correctly. The covenant of God, his way of salvation, is the greatest blessing. But if knowing, if knowing it, we turn away from that which should have been the savour of life unto life becomes the savour of death unto death. That's what Moses was saying in Deuteronomy 30. He's saying, here's the covenant, here's the privilege. I've set before you death and life. And he said, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life, that both thou and thy seed may live, that thou mayest love the Lord thy God, and that thou mayest cleave unto him, for he is thy life and the length of thy days. And every remembrance of the mark of covenant grace placed to the child is bringing before him throughout his life the memory of the covenant choice. The choice that has been solemnly laid before him. Life and death. Blessing and cursing. Choose life. Thou mayest live. Love the Lord. And be to God has given us great privilege in his word. He's given us great privilege in his sacraments. It is ours not only to study his word, but to live by it and to respond to its challenges. Above all, the challenge.
that when he says, here is my salvation, and here is my Savior, that we come and bow in submission To each of us this night, in our individual circumstances, O Lord, do thou speak. Use thy word and the greatness of Christ, the fullness of his salvation, the constancy of his covenant, the greatness of his invitation, and the wealth of the glory that he has procured, to impel us to him, to bow before him, to submit our all to him and to rejoice that we have the possibility of life, the security of life eternal in him who is thy son. Hear us and accept us. Our concluding phrase is from Psalm 111 at verse 5. The tune Winchester. He giveth meat unto all those that truly do him fear, and evermore his covenant he in his mind will bear. To the end of the psalm, Psalm 111 from verse 5, standing to sing, He giveth meat unto all those that truly do him fear.